Well, it looks like Resident Jack has something to say. Yes, I do. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed councilmen, boys and girls, retired people with nothing better to do. Danger comes in many, many forms, from the dinosaurs that tormented our caveman ancestors to the Get to the point, Jack. Oh, well then. Tell me, oh Krusty the Clown, of that pedestrian oaf who traveled across this town after getting sacked at his job at the radiation power station. Many places did he visit, moreover he suffered much by lack of purpose and general low self-esteem. Through his own folly, tries to end it all, but escapes death by chance and finds new inspiration to make his community a safer place. And who are you talking about? Homer Simpson, of course. What? Yes, you heard it right. Homer Simpson was a safety watchdog. Though this was the early days of the show, the extremely early days of the show, I might add, with the episode being the first Simpsons episode ever written and the third one ever produced and aired. As such, it is a pivotal episode for Homer's character. Homer's Odyssey is reference to the well-known epic poem attributed to the Greek bard Homer, who according to legend was blind. The Odyssey is a story about a hero named Odysseus, who goes through a very long and arduous period of suffering after the Trojan War before he could go home, all because he upset Poseidon, the god of the sea. Another definition of the word Odyssey is a long wandering which Homer himself undertakes after he loses his job as a technical supervisor, loses all hope, then finds a purpose, and finally becoming the safety inspector at the Springfield Nuclear Power Plant. May Sideshow Mel help us all. Let's take a closer look at Homer's wandering and see how it set up his character for him to be the lovable ignoramus of the series and Mr. Burns' most feared adversary. Well, sometimes at least. The episode starts with Bart's class on a field trip, conveniently going to the Springfield Nuclear Power Plant where Homer works as a technical supervisor. At the start of the tour, Mr. Smithers shows the class a propaganda film with a cartoon Adam, disregarding the risks of using nuclear power. During the tour, Terry and Sherry, Bart's classmates, attempt to taunt Bart, telling him that his father is incompetent. They tell Bart, our dad tells us that Homer Quote, spends more time napping and scarfing down donuts than doing his job. However, Bart is unperturbed by this, showing that he has a low, if not unreasonable, assessment of his father's capabilities and worth ethic. Then we see Homer, who wants to show off for Bart, so he decides to, quote, go where the action is, rather than sit on his butt eating day-old donuts. Unfortunately, Homer crashes his go-kart-like vehicle into a pipe valve, causing it to open and creating an alert. His supervisor, Terry and Sherry's father, immediately fires him, having enough of Homer's antics. Bart, seeing this embarrassing display, groans. Homer looks down in shame. End of the first act. The second act begins at the Simpsons' breakfast table. Lisa, holding a newspaper in her hands, tries to encourage Homer. Homer, downtrodden, wears a suit, indicating that he is looking for a new job. When Lisa tells him about an opening at the toxic waste dump for a supervising technician role, Homer woefully replies, quote, I'm no supervising technician, I'm a technical supervisor, adding, I've never done anything worthwhile in my life, I'm a big, worthless nothing. He is so despondent that he can't even distinguish that there is no difference in the role with the one that he had. Worried, Marge and the rest of the family chimes in to cheer him up, which works. Homer says with much added confidence after the boost from his family, I'm young, I'm able-bodied, and I'll take anything. Watch out, Springfield, here I come. He walks out the door triumphantly, ready to find a new position. This scene shows that Homer has rather elastic emotions. He can easily go up or down in mood very, very quickly. Then we see a depressing, if not hilarious, montage of Homer being denied jobs, one after the other. Upset, Homer goes to Moe's to wash away the sorrows of the day with his favorite alcoholic beverage, beer. He laments that he was, quote, just a technical supervisor who cared too much, indicating that he blames his emotions for getting in the way of his work as he wanted to show off and look cool for his son. When he wants another beer but discovers he is out of cash, 
he asks Mo for a tab. Mo, the bartender, denies his request, saying that he has no confidence that Homer will find another job, meaning that he won't be able to pay Mo back for the beer. Homer walks out of the bar dejectedly. Without his job, Homer lays on the couch all day, despondent. His three kids look over him. Bart says, all he does is lie there like an unemployed whale. Here Bart shows, again, that he does not have a high opinion of his father, likening him to a blubbering, beached-bellied whale. Lisa, the well-meaning, concerned one, replies, quote, I don't know what else to do. Bart shrugs in indifference, saying, quote, There's only one thing we can do. Take advantage of the old guy. Then he has Homer sign his report card, which is low marks. Hours later, Homer is still sitting on the couch, watching a Duff commercial at night. The commercial says, unemployed, out of work, sober, have a Duff. Homer responds to this advertisement, saying, quote, beer, now there's a temporary solution. However, he cannot find a beer in the fridge. In desperation, he steals and breaks open Bart's piggy bank, but finds that there is not enough in there to buy even one measly beer. Horrified that he has reached this new low, even for himself, he decides to end it all. Reaching for a notepad, he writes a heart-wrenching note to his family. Dear family, I am an utter failure, and you'll be better off without me. By the time you read this, I will be in my watery grave. I can only leave you with the words my father gave me, quote, stand tall, have courage, and never give up. I only hope I can provide a better model in death than I did in life. Warmest regards, love, Homer J. Simpson. He proceeds to tie a heavy rock to himself with the intention of throwing himself off a nearby bridge. Homer has lost his purpose. Unable to be the breadwinner for his family, he feels that he is undeserving of existence. He is so downtrodden that he resorted to stealing from his ten-year-old son to bottle up his sorrows. Feeling that he has nothing left to offer his family or those around him, he walks away, ignoring the advice that his father gave him. He is giving up. Here, Homer is in a depressed state. He shows what depression can do to people. It saps them of their motivation and enthusiasm for everything over time. It can lead them to pushing away loved ones and eventual self-harm. Thus, we follow Homer with the rock tied to his waist, like Sisyphus rolling a giant stone up a mountainous hill to complete a meaningless task. Fortunately, inspiration finds Homer, preventing him from committing a cruel deed upon himself and his family. The first event is at a dangerous intersection when a car almost runs him over, which the owner rudely proceeded to honk his horn at him. This might have done what Homer was attempting to accomplish, but he carries onto the bridge anyway. His family, finding the note, runs off to find him before he can do himself in. When they meet him, a tractor trailer appears on the road, almost running the family over. Homer, with the superhero-like strength of Achilles, pulls them out of the way with the heavy rock still acting as a weight, bearing him down. Now, as dawn approaches, it signals an end to Homer's depressed state and a newfound purpose emerges. He immediately comments upon saving the family from a gruesome death at the hands of a 40-wheeler, quote, Boy, this intersection is dangerous. Someone ought to put a stop sign here. A visual aid for the audience, a glowing light appears, shining on Homer's face. Inspiration has struck Homer. Marge, preoccupied, with the very good reason, I might add, asks Homer, quote, Oh, Homer, how could you think of killing yourself? We love you. Homer, with newfound cunning and vigor not unlike Odysseus, responds, quote, Kill myself? Killing myself is the last thing I'd ever do. Now I have a purpose, a reason to live. I don't care who I have to face. I don't care who I have to fight. I will not rest until this street gets a stop sign. Dawn has fully appeared. Homer's journey home is about to begin anew. The third act begins in a town hall meeting. Homer's request for a stop sign on the dangerous intersection is approved easily. His new purpose is over extremely quickly. Homer, astonished, says, quote, Wow, they listened to me. Homer, ignored and disregarded for most of his life, 
is surprised that his suggestions can be agreeable and beneficial to society. Struck by this realization, his confidence blooms, telling Marge his continued resolve. Quote, If they think I'm going to stop at that stop sign, they're sadly mistaken. Thus, Homer Simpson, a clumsy simpleton, becomes an unlikely crusader for public safety. With his apparent successes, Homer sets his sights on a new target, coming to a realization that his accomplishments mean little, quote, small potatoes as he describes it. He describes a feeling we would describe as diminishing returns, where each experience after the first one, the most powerful and exhilarating, becomes less and less meaningful. Since Homer is getting less satisfaction from each new sign he puts up, he sets out to find a more meaningful crusade, pointing out the very apparent danger of the extremely unsafe power plant. He tells his family, quote, There's a danger in this town that is bigger than all the dips put together, pointing to the power plant. Seeing Homer's new ambition to make a meaningful change for the community, Bart begins to gain respect for his father, whispering, Wow, my dad's a hero. This is significant because prior to this moment, Bart had a low opinion of his father, evidenced by him not pushing back at Sherry and Terry's taunts about his dad and taking advantage of his grief by having him sign his report card. As Homer, standing in the community as a safety advocate and his ambition to protest the power plant grows, Bart is noticeably impressed and starts to admire his father for once. When Homer asks him what he whispered, Bart replies with a bland nothing. But Homer replies that he will assume he heard what he thought Bart said, strengthening his resolve to tackle the issue of the dangerous plant with his son's respect for him on the line. At the rally to protest the power plant, Homer is greeted as a hero, rather than the mock fool he was at the start of the episode. A hype man says, quote, I give you the man whose very name is synonymous with safety, Homer Simpson. The crowd goes wild. The scene pans with dramatic music to Mr. Charles Montgomery Burns, the owner of the plant and the primary antagonist of the series. As this was the first episode written, this was meant to be his first appearance proper for the show. Burns observes the scene, commenting that Homer is a charismatic leader, with the crowd, quote, eating out of the palm of his hand. He asks Smithers, his sycophantic second-in-command, who Homer is. Smithers says, quote, He used to work here in the plant, but we fired him for gross incompetence. Smithers here highlights the irony. Homer leaving the plant actually made it safer. Burns, absorbing the information, incorrectly thinks Homer is playing a game as revenge for being fired rather than a passionate advocate caring about the well-being of the community. This shows Mr. Burns' cynical way of thinking, usually assuming that someone is acting out of petty personal reasons rather than acting for others over oneself. As a result of his thinking, he orders Smithers to bring Simpson up to him, setting up a showdown between Homer and his old boss. Upon meeting Homer, Burns wants him back at the plant in order to disperse the popular movement that Homer created, thus getting rid of his problem at once. Homer's charismatic leadership, building a movement that could topple his plant, and the general anti-nuclear power sentiment that Homer has fostered within the town. He is chopping the head off the dragon. Without Homer, the crowd will fall. Homer first rejects the offer, but Burns chimes in, saying that he would not return to his old job as a technical supervisor, but a new role in charge of safety at the plant. Burns' motivation is clear. With Homer, the well-known safety advocate, in place as safety inspector in the plant, the people will think that the problems that the plant create, radiation and pollution, will have been solved. However, Burns, knowing that Homer is incompetent from Smithers, realizes that this is just a quick fix to get rid of the present problem, not really doing much to fix the ever-present dangers of the plant. Homer, knowing this as well, objects, pointing out that, quote, he caused more accidents at the plant than any other employee. Also leaning in towards Burns and adding in a hushed tone, there were even a few doozies no one ever found out about. Burns, unperturbed by these obvious reasons not to hire Homer, gives him a 30-second ultimatum, take the job or walk away. Homer tries to think internally about the pros and cons, thinking about his work ethic and family, but keeps getting distracted, ending in him thinking, quote, what should I do in an exasperated manner? When Burns tells him that time is up, Homer responds, quote, What the hey, I'll take the job. Pleased with Homer's decision, Burns gives him his assignment, quote, Your first duty will be to tell that crowd this plant is safe. 
Homer, realizing that he has made a Faustian bargain, a deal with the devil, exclaims, What? Burns continues to pressure Homer. Homer walks out to the balcony of Burns' office and begins to address the crowd. He starts to give them Burns' order, but loses heart after seeing the crowd. Conflicted, he goes back inside to Burns. Burns is in his armchair, tapping his fingers on the upholstery, showing his impatience. An important argument between Burns and Homer starts. Homer says, quote, I can't do it, Mr. Burns. Burns replies, You mean you're willing to give up a good job and a raise just for your principles? Homer responds, When you put it that way, it does sound a little far-fetched, but that's the lug you're looking at. And I vow to continue spending every free minute I have crusading for safety. Of course, I'd have a lot less of those free minutes if you just gave me the job. Burns, taking this information in, responds, You're not as stupid as you look or sound, or our best testing indicates. You've got the job. Now get to work. Homer concludes the art conversation. I'll get to work, but first I have to say goodbye to some friends. He walks out to the balcony again. This conversation is significant because it is a clash of values. Burns, cynical to the core, is astonished by Homer's idealism, his determination to stand by his principles. Burns, having more money than he knows what to do with, is used to buying people out. His thought that the offer of a raise and a steady employment would be enough for Homer to cede his principles, having watched so many before Homer do the same, becoming his puppet for him to control. But here, Homer shows his character growth. He is no longer the despondent man, wanting to get into the action. He is in the thick of the action. He cannot let the crowd of people, and more importantly, his son, down. He knows that he has become a role model for the community in his safety crusade, if not a public nuisance to some, and he must resist the temptation to go back on his principles even if he stands to gain financially from it. He may be poor, but he is not spineless, at least not in this moment. Although he does give Burns a way out, seeking a compromise with his comment of saying that he would have less time advocating for safety if Burns gives him the job. Burns, realizing that this seemingly incompetent idiot has cornered him into a stalemate, realizes that he cannot make Homer tell the crowd that the plan is safe. Thus, Burns must settle for a compromise with Homer, giving him the job with the hope that Homer's ascendancy to the position will be enough to soothe the discontent that Homer has created against the plant. Without their leader, the opposition will crumble. Here, Burns shows some respect for Homer, which he rarely displays for people, acknowledging that Homer has forced him to cede to some of his wishes in order for him to get what he wants in the end. As well, this scene begins the type of writing that many commentators in the 90s described as the appeal of The Simpsons to a mass audience, its edginess compared to other television media. A rosier show, like Leave it to Beaver or Ozzy and Harriet, would paint a romantic and completely inaccurate image of life, one that was always hopeful and optimistic with a message of not challenging the status quo because life now is good and it was meant to be enjoyed, not questions. The Simpsons showed a grittier, more realistic take on the world. It was the Dark Knight trilogy of its time, lampooning its light-hearted predecessors and taking a grim approach to the majority culture of the time. The show aimed to be iconoclastic rather than glorifying the past and present. Because the writers of the show took this approach, this cartoon was more grounded and realistic than its live-action counterparts, which allowed it to carve out a considerable audience with those who wanted something different. Today, The Simpsons has become the dominant culture in terms of animation media, with shows like South Park, Family Guy, Rick and Morty, BoJack Horseman, and many others emulating and expanding on their style. But it did not start out that way. The Simpsons were the weird kids at school, not understood and horrifying to the morally upright, religious folk. They were edgy, before edgy became edgy for the sake of edgy. Cycling back from this tangent, we conclude our tale. Homer, on the balcony of the office complex, addresses his crowd of devoted followers. He has a message to deliver. Compared to his earlier note to his family, it shows that Homer has grown. Although in a sense he is abandoning the crowd, like he intended to do with his family, He imparts upon them a message. To continue to live on and to stick to your principles, he tells them, You have come to depend on me as your safety watchdog, so you won't scrape yourself or stub your toes or blow yourselves up. But you can't depend on me all your life. 
You have to learn that there's a little Homer Simpson in all of us, and I'm going to have to live without your respect and awe. The only reason I'm telling you this is because I'm going to be leaving you. The crowd gasps in sorrow. But don't worry, he tells them. I have just been appointed the new safety inspector at this very plant. With a big, fat raise, the crowd cheers. Although Homer is indirectly sacrificing his principles for working for Burns, the reason why he says that he lives without the respect in all the town, it is only because, as we see, he neglects his job in the future. He fails to maintain his role as a safety watchdog through his laziness and poor work ethic. Smithers comments on Homer's ineptitude shortly after this in the season 2 episode, Simpson and Delilah, saying that accidents have went down in Homer's sector after his promotion, arguing that there was a cause and effect relationship between the two. Homer Simpson is inherently unsafe, yet here, in the early installment weirdness of the first season, Homer is Mr. Safe in an unsafe world. The show even mocks this showing Homer's clumsiness at the end of the episode, falling ungracefully from the balcony onto the crowd, which cheerfully catches him and carries him away in time for the credits. Unaware of the dangers that he will present, like multiple near meltdowns and the like, because of his inattentiveness and lack of professional training for the job. This leads to the question, how did this episode handle Homer's character development? This is the first episode to highlight exclusively on Homer that the world saw. Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire was a family-centric episode, while Bart the Genius was a Bart-centric episode. As the original plan for the series was for Bart to be the main focus of the show, with Marge, Lisa, and Homer being secondary, Homer's story here is important to the overall legacy of the show, with the transition from Bart to Homer as the main character and the main source of humor for the show over the years. The reason for it is simple. Homer is easier to write than Bart, and there is more that can be done with his character. Homer is an adult, thus having more opportunities and reason to write or an episode around, rather than the 10-year-old, school-bound Hellraiser. He is also an easier butt monkey. Homer's pain is more easily digestible to the audience as a grown, overweight man than a 10-year-old child. Perhaps most importantly was the main demographic that the network was trying to target for the show, the all-important 18-49-year-old to block. Homer, being in this demographic, is more relatable to the intended audience than Bart. For the same reason, if The Simpsons was a kid's show, which people initially incorrectly assumed because they thought that animation was only for kids, then Bart would have had more appeal to this intended audience as a young boy. In addition, Homer is a more flexible character and personality. His moment in the kitchen with the family shows his emotional elasticity, which is wonderful for comedy and tragedy for that matter. In one moment, Homer can be a responsible adult, tirelessly advocating for safety, to a buffoon that reacts rather than thinking things through in another, as evidenced by his contemplation about Burns' ultimatum, drifting off to thinking about Burns' desk and clothes, rather than the critical idea of whether to take the safety inspector job or not. Homer, like the ancient heroes Odysseus and Achilles, is a larger-than-life figure, but he also has to deal with domestic and interpersonal relationships in the present whether that be in 1990 or 2020. And if the lifespans of the actors that play the characters weren't an issue, we would probably see another 30 years of The Simpsons, as the writers have clearly shown us they have stories for years and years. Hello there, Jack here. Since you made it through the video, why not comment and let me know what you think. While you're at it, like as well. If you like these analyses, please subscribe to my channel. I'll see you all next week. And remember, as Bender says, bite my shiny metal...